Open your minds, your hearts, your very souls, good people, to what you are going to see and hear. You know, I think the thing that sets human beings apart from other creatures is a built-in dissatisfaction. There's an itch that we have that can't be scratched. Our efforts to scratch it have created civilization, which is essentially the practice of trying to adapt the environment to us rather than adapting ourselves to the environment. decided long ago that we were terrified by nature and that we needed to be more powerful so that we weren't threatened by nature so much. The flight to land first men on the moon. Technology means power to us. It symbolizes potentially immortality. This is the fantasy that somehow we can transcend our horrible condition of being human through these shiny black boxes. You become a god. You have the power to change reality. You have the power to create reality. When you look on the TV, and is anything you see real? Nobody knows anymore. With the, the, some of the digital imagery, with some of the retouching, some of the 3D animation, what you see, is, it's, it isn't real. And with this technology, it lets me be a god, and it lets me create my reality. What is rightfully mine, Mac? Karina! <laughs> controlled environment only because you can control whether there's pollution, you can control what's in the ocean, control what's on the sand, the beach. It's just a cleaner environment. They've had a lot of experience to change things. In a sense, tourism begins as a kind of controlled environment. Middle class people could now travel and see the world. It used to be that going to exotic places required a certain hardiness of spirit, and now it was a more controlled experience, less random, with guides to take you. And now that's been brought home. I mean, you don't have to go to the pyramids anymore. The pyramids can come to you. You know, uh, I've worked so hard all the week. Last Sunday before last was such a birdie day and all. At Epcot Center at Disney World or in Las Vegas, you can see reproductions of all those things and they're they're ever so much nicer than what you can see in, in the real world. You can have a nice sort of dinner in, in a Mexican pyramid and watch the volcano explode at just the right time. And, you know, you're guaranteed of having the experience that you were expecting. It seems to me that now what we have is the capacity to literally create the environment that we want to be in. That is to make available environments that would not be normally available to most people. 
I mean, it's an extension of something like a, a shopping mall or something like the Metrodome. microcosmic uh, representation of nature, optimized and sanitized so that it is precisely as we want it, and it becomes exceedingly available. It's all packaged for me. My world is packaged for me. I just have to consume it. In a sense, what you've done is filtered all the hazards out of the natural experience and just distilled those parts of the experience which are pleasant, uh, positive, danger-free. I guess the next step is literally to sit in a, in a booth and not be on skis at all, not wear a pocket. The virtual reality issue is tremendously seductive, fascinating. You know, if you can create not only an indoor environment that replicates this, but you have a kind of virtual reality where you sit yourself down in a chair and uh, somehow or other you're strapped in and uh, you enjoy the experience of skiing without ever skiing. You never master the techniques, you just gain the experience. trying to figure out ways to reduce the sense of separation that having bodies gives us. If we start to inhabit an environment where we can't take our bodies, I think the difference between mind starts to go away, and I you know, personally view that as being a positive development. Virtual reality is defined to mean that thing that you could create that would become immersive through the use of computers, iPhones, and some kind of uh, physical mapping system like a data glove or bodysuit. I always tell people if they want to understand what virtual reality is, they should take a look at Las Vegas. Las Vegas is a real clear case of the map having gotten so substantial that people can walk around in it and feel like they are in full immersive three-dimensional reality even though the whole thing is created. We're used in the mummification process of the king. Underneath the middle bed of...
my name is Charlotte Richards, here at the Little White Wedding Chapel in Las Vegas, Nevada. I've been performing weddings for the last 35 years. And as I see technology advancing, I decided a drive-up wedding window would be a, a very up-to-date way of getting married. My next step is uh, by television where I will be sitting at a television monitor and the couple will be monitored. And uh, I think television's great, don't you? <laughs> There's this odd blurring between the reality of marriage and the simulation of Elvis impersonators that sort of blends in some strange way and creates some sort of hyper-real environment. Is this a natural thing? Well, not much about our society is natural anymore. Town Square has been replaced by the mall and the friendly neighborhood coffee shop has been replaced by the fast food outlet. A lot of things have contributed to the kind of rootless, alienated society we live in. We are in an era in which the natural world is threatened by uh, human activity. So we can't drink from our rivers. The air is polluted. The food chain is suffering. At the same time, we can retreat into a synthetic world in which we have artificial trees and artificial skies and artificial animals. I think the day might come when some of those worst science fiction fantasies come true. Uh, the electricity goes off and you discover you're not living in paradise, you're living in hell. ここには日常を超えた体験があります。ここには日常を超えた時があります。ここにはパラダイスがあります。フェニックスリゾート市街や王シャンドーム、宮崎に誕生。I'd like to be able to get the sun on a beach and all that, but not have any of the pollution and any of the bad things that are on there. Not have to worry about the sharks or the jellyfish or anything like that. I think there's been a long-standing dream of rediscovering paradise. So that if we have urban space, which has sort of separated us from nature, then our dream of technology will be about technology giving us a pristine natural environment again within the city that can incorporate parks and greenery and oxygen.
7号の接近により宮崎県地方は午後5時ごろに暴風域に入ることが予想されます。It's really a, a kind of、uh, manifestation of our capacity to control the world and to control nature. Outside, we don't have that control. Nature still shows that it can do us in at any moment. Inside this encapsulated reality, we are in control. I guess interesting questions that arise as a result of、uh, of this. I've always thought, in some ways, that、um, the ecological problems, problems of ecology, are essentially problems of transformation. That is, we might, in the end,、uh, transform the world in such a way that we won't be able to adapt to it. That is, we literally won't be able to live in the world that we create. With IMAX films and computer databases, and the unbelievable ability we have to store information, in a sense, we can set about cataloging nature. And my dark nightmare of that is that once we've cataloged it, we won't need nature anymore, because after all, we can always summon up an image of these great extinct species, so that you know I will never miss them when they're gone. I won't even know about it. If we do get the ability to have complete control over the structure of matter,、uh, will we, in effect, become omnipotent? It sounds like this is true because if we can build anything that we want to build, then what is going to stop us from doing just absolutely anything at all? The technology doesn't mean any one thing, and that it's not giving us a flawless universe. But it's allowing people to create what it is they want to create. Some people may want to live in a space station in which everything is controlled down to the last molecule. There'd be no bugs or rats, mice, anything. There'd be nothing up there that you didn't want.、And、not everyone is、uh, going to want to do that. However, I, I certainly wouldn't. I tend to like planet Earth with all of its imperfections. Oh boys, that's it. Hope this trip is as easy as your last one. Thanks. It should be. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. Fire pilot jets. There's a whole universe out there, Steve. Totally unknown, beyond anyone's comprehension. Over. 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 Commander, we can.
got Bogey from Alpha Sector coming in fast. Commander, we're detecting an energy surge. They're charging weapons. Ensign, notify the stellar command if we're under attack. Get Gamma Squadron off the deck pronto. Life on Earth has always been very boring to me. That's why I started going to the clubs, because it gives me a chance to be whatever I want. And that's why I hope in the near future, there will be like colonies on other planets where hopefully there will be other people like me, where everyone is accepted no matter what they are. enlightenment, a new humanism, or a transhumanism as I prefer to call it, a humanism which looks beyond current human abilities and limits and applies reason and science and objective truth and research to improving humans' possibilities. Seven, six, five. I personally think we're going to have to wait until we have cheap space transportation so we can get off the planet and into space where there's plenty of room and then we can start whole new societies. Not having the physical bands of the Earth and, and the excuse of limited space, people will want to try all kinds of different social experiments. In the absence of geography, since we've explored the world, now there's a construction of new geographies through the computer, or through simulation, or through digitalization, or through replacement of the body. Mon travail est vraiment en fait une, une lutte contre la nature, l'idée de Dieu, l'inexorable, le programmé, l'ADN qui est chargé de la représentation. Et c'est pour cela que moi je suis allé puiser dans la chirurgie, la chirurgie esthétique. Non pas pour une amélioration ou bien un rajeunissement, mais pour un changement total d'image, même jusqu'à un changement total d'identité. The most avant-garde thing that I did for Alain was to put implants in her forehead temple area. This is not something that's described anywhere, it's something that she and I devised. She wanted to have a prominence there that looks like the forehead of the Mona Lisa. And they look actually very interesting, and not quite anatomically like anything, but, um, uh, but it was part of this sort of work in progress that she and I devised. Hollande, we have a, a fax. The first question is, what will the body be in the future? J'ai dit que j'ai donné mon corps à l'art, mais l'idée est vraiment de poser le problème du corps, du statut du corps dans notre société et dans les générations futures via les manipulations génétiques, de se préparer mentalement à ce problème.
I think a lot of the questions that she asks are very troubling. You know, what exactly is the body? How much can you change it? What is the relationship between the mind and the body? I think that these things upset people and disturb them, and so people say, oh, this is nonsense, you shouldn't be doing it. But without advocating that everyone should go out and do performance art, I think that it plays an important role. One of the issues here is turning the body into a controlled environment. And of course, the ethical questions become massive. I mean, if we can control the body, does it necessarily mean that we should? In a way, it becomes a moot point. If we can, we will. But where does that stop? And of course, this has found a massive popularity with adolescents who are casting themselves as mutants who somehow need to control their own bodies through a mutant stigmata of piercings and tattooings and ways of turning the body into a sign. I guess I'm a body artist because I, I always change like the way I look and the way I like whatever I Whatever I do to myself, I just change all the time. I do get bored with how I look. Like one day I like look in the mirror and I'm like, oh, I looked like that yesterday. So then I change. Change is an art form, I guess. This is my art. I live it every day. I'm a walking work of art. So what I really look like, you agree. <laughs> I'm actually completely plastic. Here's my battery pack. But as long as someone replaces the batteries once in a while, I'll be okay. My favorite piercing, by the way, in case you were wondering, is my tongue. I have it pierced twice. And my most hideable face piercing is my nose. And it's right there. It's all sneaky hideaway. But I usually actually wear a big silver ring in it, but I'm job hunting today. It's the cyborgization of humanity. We're taking the machine uh, inside us and, and uniting with it. And on some level, we would all like to have replaceable parts. We already do. We have uh, uh, artificial hearts, uh, kidneys, and so forth. We're waiting for the time when, when those things are actually improvements over the original. And uh, you'll be able to you know, put your parts in and, and take your parts out at, uh, at leisure. Perhaps they experience being the opposite sex without making permanent surgical changes and, and so forth. Yes, love of, love of technology, love of the hyper-real is a, a major theme of these times. It's a love-hate relationship. La peau est décevante. Dans la vie, on n'a que sa peau. Mais il y a mal donne dans les rapports humains. Parce que l'on n'est jamais ce que l'on a. On a toujours un sentiment d'étrangeté quand on se regarde dans la glace. Mais euh, il y a des moments où tout à coup ce sentiment d'étrangeté est beaucoup plus grand. Donc essayez que devant le miroir, il n'y ait de moins en moins ce sentiment d'étrangeté. When I was very young, I started on female hormones and that changed my body into what my mind thought it should be. I all along wanted to become a woman and um, and I had a boyfriend pay for my sex change operation and I had that done and I've been happy ever since. It's very important for transsexuals and people of gender confusion to have a way of escaping being trapped in a body. But I personally would like to remain as natural as possible and be gorgeous. Nothing is natural. Nothing is naturally occurring. Everything deals with the chemicals in your body and the way you are programmed from the time you are a child. Everything you saw, everything you heard programmed you, just like a computer. That programming can be undone. The mind is changing 
Through the computers, they're artificial. The mind itself is expanding. Like through virtual reality, through other projects, you are experiencing new experiences. It's not, a, it's not drugs. It's At all. Just, it's like, smart. just ingenious. Right. And we and people like us have, understand that, and we we're like so far beyond. We try to like expand other people. Right. If I was say to become a woman in some sort of virtual reality, then I could perhaps bring some of that experience back with me, so that I would be a more full individual, if you will. And I think the whole thing about life is to be illuminated, to see what's really going on around you, and to illuminate others as well. Extropians are people who want to push back limits of all kinds. So we tend to challenge not just things that uh, other people challenge, like political limits or the limits we can see today, but we're interested in any kind of limits that humans have traditionally accepted. One big one, of course, is human lifespan. We want to push back the limits to human life so we can live indefinitely long, which will mean removing, getting rid of these human bodies and becoming post-human, as we call it. I don't think there are any liberations from reality. I mean, the only liberation from reality that I'm familiar with is death. And even that, you know, it's just that we don't have any reports from the field there. Just think of how long it takes to learn what you need in order to get by in life. It takes a process of primary school education, which is 10 or 12 years, and high school, and college, and graduate school. So finally, at the age of 40, you have what you need to go through life. And you may have 20 years in which you ply your trade and practice whatever it is you learned uh, for the first 40 years. And then you're dead. Uh, it's not the way to go. What we're asking people to do is to change their worldview, change their whole outlook on life. Uh, people grow up expecting that they will die, their children will then grow up and they will die, and their children will grow up and die. But suppose it suddenly dawns on you that your children may not die, and they may not. Altogether, there are about 50 people frozen now, I believe. Um, here at the Cryonics Institute, we have 11. And who were they? Well, as I said, one was my mother, one was my first wife. I'm very interested in immortality, and uh, I'm much older than I look, and the way I, I stay that way is I take some of the substances that have been discovered that uh, prolong life. When it's time for me to go, I will be all taken care of. I'm looking forward to being brought back, and I don't know exactly what's going to be there, but... Whatever it is, I'll be glad of it. It's better than rotten. <laughs> we have, at the present time, uh, two cats and one dog at the Cryonics Institute. The other organizations also uh, have pets in uh, suspension. And, of course, the uh, prices are proportionately lower price goes more or less according to size. A lot of people are inter interested in saving their dogs and cats. I like cryonics because I'm dating a 17-year-old boy. I'm 28, and I want to, like, wait for him. <laughs> I want to wake up when he's 25. Well, I guess you could say, if he's in somebody's body, we'll be able to preserve it. But. What I waking feel, them back up is the wake, problem. Yeah, because when you wake somebody back up, I think that the age is gonna, you know, come at them harder. They gotta, yeah. they gotta watch out for the age difference. Like 
Walt Disney. Look how old he is now. You know what I'm saying? And when they, if they ever do find a way to unfreeze him and bring him back to life, he's just gonna die again. Because how old he is, you know what I'm saying? Obviously, uh, patients uh, who have suffered considerable damage, uh, whether by freezing or through old age or through some uh, terminal disease or injury, uh, will need considerable repair before they can be made young and healthy. And this means that we will need detailed control over human biology. One way of looking at this is that all you have to do to make a person healthy or young or both is to rearrange his atoms and molecules a little bit. There is a word that has come into use recently referring to molecular engineering or the manipulation of matter at the atomic and molecular level, and that word is nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is this uh, plan for gaining complete control over the structure of matter. So if you have a person with a damaged heart, for example, you could have little robots stream through the bloodstream under computer control or under some kind of human control and they could affect the repairs that were necessary. So in a sense you have a sort of uh, a type of omnipotence. I myself don't worry about whether this is blasphemous or we're trying to play God. We're simply trying to gain the control that we are able to over nature and over our own selves. This is the new improved Santa. Hmm. Plug him in. Merry Christmas. People who are most offended by the results of mechanistic technology are also the ones who most vehemently oppose biotechnology and nanotechnology, which are really the options, uh, which are really nature-based technologies. You know, we are moving from the industrial model to the biological model. Well, there are individuals who think that cyberspace is unnatural and that computers in some sense are artificial, but you have to realize that our brain is in some sense a tremendous computer. And it may take many centuries before we have true robots that can simulate the functions of the brain, but there is a continuum.
get to the point where we can simulate a person and their reaction so well because we'll understand the chemical, the formulation of the body, and all that so well that maybe we will have computers that are basically people. The reason why we don't have mechanical butlers and mechanical maids, the reason is pattern recognition. Computers can see, but they don't recognize. They don't understand. I don't think robots are going to replace human beings. I think what we're going to see is more of a merger of human beings and robots to become some kind of combined organism. In the next few years, we're going to start seeing household robots appear. And they have to be fairly sophisticated. They have to be able to move around a house without bumping into things and knocking things over. And they have to learn their surroundings. So we're going to see a spectrum from very stupid uh, to very smart. I definitely think that artificial intelligence is it's already it's starting. Artificial. It's already happening. Yeah. And it will take over. It definitely will take over. And I don't think that man is really ready to accept that. Now that you're transferring human consciousness from the brain to a machine of some kind, it puzzles many people because they tend to think of themselves, because of religious ideas, as essentially a soul. They think there's some non-physical spiritual matter inside this human body. And so if you talk about transferring personality from the brain to a computer, they, they don't see how that's possible. The brain is a combination, unless you're a deeply religious person and you believe that the spirit is something other than the, the human existence is biology, chemistry, and electronics, combined in a very unique way. The brain is a finite system of neurons. Once you figure it out, once you've got a template for it, it's just a question of running the map. Piece of cake. Obviously, in a human life, there's too much information to fully assimilate, but you can make a good, educated guess. That's what artificial life's all about, too. A good, educated guess. So, can we download our personalities? Yeah, maybe. Uploading them is a different story, though. Downloading them? I think so. We'll get there eventually. Right now, we're not in very good control of our impulses. We tend to get angry and envious and jealous and have wars all the time. If we made some changes to our genetics and our neurochemistry, we might better control those things. And we're beginning to see just the bare beginnings of that and some of the, the chemicals people are using, like Prozac is a very crude example, of something which moderates personality. But I think we'll see far more sophisticated chemical control of our brains, which we can choose ourselves as individuals and choose who we want to be. At the edge of our culture, people are starting to view drugs as information. You take a particular combination of chemicals to create a particular response in your brain and your nervous system. And uh, you find that response perhaps useful in, in getting a different view of reality. These people no longer feel constrained by the social rules of the past. If you take ecstasy, it takes your ego away so you have a better time relating with people and understanding what people have to like say or do like even if it's just for a little while that experience can change like your whole life the first time i took ecstasy i saw people in a whole different light i saw them like all is good and like everybody else was on ecstasy too so they were all good i like um like optical optical like um machines that sort of like um tap into the, the visual cortex and sort of like stimulate your brain. When you high, 
like your mind all the time, you just, it's like, it plays, you know, just what you see, you exaggerate. Everything you, you see is exaggerated. <laughs> Chocolate, a lot of chocolate, sugar, white, synthetic sugar, MDMA ecstasy. human psychology is to know how to operate your brain and that means to be able to expand consciousness and in the past they the psychiatrists and the ministers and priests that were either sane or you're crazy and throughout human history they the controllers that want to scare us there's sanity and what's real and that's what we're in charge of and anything else is sinful psychotic evil daft hallucinatory And the mind itself becomes a controlled environment as we move in and begin to understand it more and map it. This terrain becomes something we can handle. We're just beginning to understand the human brain. Uh, brain chemistry started in the late 1970s, and it's moving very quickly thanks to computer modeling and so forth. There are new synthetic drugs being made, uh, both psychedelic and intelligence drugs. Hello. Hi. We're Mike. And DMT. And we're the bartenders. Smart drinks. Smart drinks are us. We make these drinks. Which have vitamins, minerals, and amino acids. Out of juice and fresh fruits. And we put them in cups. And we in also cups. offer ginseng. And we, well, we do a lot of experiments. Yeah, we, we like mix around. Fructose, choline, chromium. This has ginkgo in it, which is a chemical that like clears the mind and focuses. This has choline in it, and it's good if you smoke a lot of pot. It works very well. Yeah, if you do. But... No, no alcohol. alcohol. We have no alcohol at the bar. Alcohol is a sin. And that's our job. That's what we do. And we do that at every single rave in America, every day. My day in and day out. Worldwide. Yep. Woo! Smart drugs, sometimes called nootropics from the Greek noos, meaning mind, are drugs which are able to increase human intelligence, concentration, and other cognitive abilities without uh, unpleasant side effects. It's not getting high. Smart drugs are not about that. It's giving you an edge. And a 10% edge, when I'm sitting down at the keyboard, when I'm making animation, or when I'm writing or something, the edge that I get from that is very much worth it. Although it's not very safe to prescribe them to yourself in some cases. I do anyway. I've used myself as a pharmaceutical guinea pig quite a bit. And um, I've never, with the exception of one time where I was a little nauseated, by hydrogen, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's never hurt me yet. There's a whole paradigm in medicine which says that what doctors are there to do is to cure disease, to remedy problems, to fix things. They don't have any idea that medicine should be there to increase human abilities beyond the norm. Therefore, the FDA won't approve drugs for increasing human intelligence, increasing concentrational memory, only for giving those people people with cognitive deficits, you know, people with senility, to try and remove those problems and bring them back to normal. But you can't, uh, you can't get drugs approved to, to make you better than normal.
last person in the world you want giving you drugs. They'll change your opinion in your mind is a government authorized scientist. It's a nightmare. So we, we, we glorious victory of the 60s. We took the power to change your conscience away from the medical. And even today with Prozac, you know, it's no longer the psychiatrist that do it, it's the general practitioner, you know. And, that's, and even the, the idea of self-medication, you know, sure, uh, uh, get a friendly doctor, but yeah. You hear these people talk about Prozac. I'm not pushing Prozac, I've never had it, but it's interesting that they're saying now, we were saying about LSD in the 60s, you have to learn your own uh, rhythm and how it affects you. It, it raises your self-esteem, it confuses you. See, it's a, but it's gotta be you in charge of your brain. The people who change, the people who make the difference are reprogrammed. You can do that through drugs, you can do that through meditation, you can do that now through virtual reality. Computers are helping us with that. To assimilate another existence, to become somebody else somewhere else is a fantastic experience. Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm 12 years old and I'm blonde, 5 feet 4, and really, really cute. What do you look like? When you're dealing with people in this environment, you're just dealing with their words. In essence, you're just dealing with pure abstracted mind. and. The impression that you receive from that is really quite different from the one you get when it's being projected against a face and a body. I mean, I, I talk to people on the phone, and when I meet them physically, I'm not particularly surprised. I am always surprised by physical encounters with people I've previously met virtually. This thing makes it possible for me to be everywhere, in a sense. I mean, uh, I have communications with people that I've never met all over the world. I mean, we are, we are together in this virtual place called cyberspace, where there isn't any time and there isn't any distance. Uh, of course, when you're in a place where there isn't any time and isn't any distance, it's kind of like being nowhere at all. Hi, this is Steve Roberts, Nomadic Research Labs. You've reached the cellular phone aboard Behemoth, the networked recumbent bicycle. I'm not on the bike at the moment, so please leave a message, and when I'm back on the road, I'll find it and call you back. Thank you. You know, it's allowed me to redefine home as something virtual. In the old days, before I lived on the net, I had homes in places like Louisville, Kentucky, and Columbus, Ohio, and the thought of moving and wandering involved a tremendous amount of disruption in life. That whole issue has just disappeared because I treat the network as home. So my physical location is irrelevant. This is the control console here. The main screen is a Macintosh, and that's where I do most of my work. All my electronic mail and writing and things like that take place there. Mapping software, I use a program called GeoQuery that brings up a map of the area that I'm in. If I was ever stuck on an island someplace, the, the one most important thing I would want would be a computer with a net connection. want to be in a non-space. I want to be in a public, physical space with nice people around having nice drinks. I, I just, I think I need that kind of environment far more than the kind of disembodied online cyberspace community. Well, coffee shops, they tend to draw in people who are not that familiar with computers or not so technologically oriented. I think it's really great that they position the terminals in, actually in cafes. Often it's very shy people who use this, you know. Not, not entirely. It tends to be either very shy people or very, very gregarious people. People will come out of their shells a lot more because they're not forced to represent themselves in a physical form and they know that people will be forgiving. They have a few more seconds to think out what they type. It's just not as intimidating and not as immediate of a situation when you're really just on a text-based universe. Is it any more unusual to meet someone through a computer system than to go to a public place where alcohol is served and strike up a conversation with a stranger? Of course, people are not always 
what they represent themselves to be, whether that's in a bar or on a computer bulletin board system. So I think the same warnings apply, but that doesn't preclude the possibility that they could become a friend or a lover or even a spouse. Netters tend to move in together and live in the same houses. And they call the houses that they live in shacks, you know, like there's a nerd shack. And, uh, nerd shacks are great. The, uh, the first place I moved into in San Jose was a nerd shack, and it was really a blast because there were seven people moved into this house, and they'd all met each other over, over BBSs. That's so true. every one of them had a phone line and a computer, and whenever, like, Domino's Pizza or something would come by to deliver us a pizza, we had set up all of the machines in the living room. They were all set up. I mean, the guy thought he'd walked into, like, NORAD Center or something. It is to meet this threat that the Air Force has been developing SAGE, the semi-automatic ground environment system, a network of geographical defense sectors covering the continental United States and extending into Canada. Now we begin to essentially think of the whole Earth as one shell, all hooked up by internet, a living thinking shell that may eventually solve what happened at the instant of creation. What's interesting about the internet or, or the so-called uh, information superhighway uh, really is the fact that it's been a, a broad and lawless terrain. This was the Wild West in virtual form for a period of time. It will still continue to be pretty wild just because of its largeness and its intensity and the amount of people and the amount of information flying around in there. seeing with the increasing realism of the computer networks. Instead of just words on a screen, we're going to see images. We're going to see three-dimensional images. The electronic world becoming more and more realistic. We already have billions of people around the world sitting in their rooms looking at little television boxes all day, uh, passively receiving the entertainment that's fed to them. Now that people have an opportunity to look at a little box and communicate through it, I ask you, is that more alienating or is that connecting people? More of our uh, social interaction, of course, takes place uh, inside of media and inside of information space. And uh, 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 many of us are just as ticklish uh, and just as playful in that, in that area and just as sexual in that area as, as we are in our physical bodies. Uh, the brain is already the primary erotic organ just sends uh, messages to uh, our genitals and, and, and so forth. Um, so the way to eroticize the brain is to explore sexuality through media. It's nothing new that the human race is obsessed with sex. And therefore, uh, when a new communication technology comes along, there will be a form of sexual expression that will come along very quickly and use that technology. I'm quite sure that very soon after the invention of the printing press, people were printing dirty books. People have been doing this for years through pornography, of course. And now we're gonna have all kinds of other different forms of mediated sexual intercourse including online, virtual reality, and so forth. I think that uh, everybody will become uh, much more experimental in these areas. Lift off. Lift off. Now, the internet was developed by the US military to be a command and control center that it could not be shut down. You know, in the event of a nuclear attack, right, the internet would still be standing. Well, I doubt that they thought people would be talking about sex on the internet someday, but now we are, and nobody can shut us up. With online communication, if you put an image up on a BBS, within an hour, you know, there could be a thousand 
duplicates of that image. And how are you going to go back and, and say, OK, everybody turn in their, their picture of, you know, that dog sex photo? People have said, oh, what's your hottest VR fantasy? What's your hottest virtual reality fantasy? I would really like to experience sexuality from a man's point of view, from a genetic male point of view. Historically, people have taken drugs to induce, you know, states of ecstasy. And then now some people say, hey, the computer is a way to induce that state of ecstasy only, you know, without the high price of, you know, having some dealer around. of sex and machines, I guess my Hitachi magic wand, you know, is, is my favorite toy. And um, beyond that, I guess maybe my power book. But I don't really have sex with my power book. You know, I just use it to, to have sex with somebody else. Hi, I'm back. You've got the credits now, so let's get busy. How do you ask for a date? What about this? Uh, Ian? Well, uh, how about a date? Uh, well, I mean... Well, really, no thanks, Woody. The most sort of enticing notion of all is to be able to experience sex within the context of a virtual reality. There's no rejection. You don't have to go through the whole wooing process. Any fantasy object from Mel Gibson to Michelle Pfeiffer becomes available to you. Hi, baby. We know what you want. Yeah, we're going to make you explode. Come on, baby. Do it now. Which one do you want to try first? supposed to be working, uh, not fooling around on the job. You know I'm going to have to do something about this. Well, what should I do? Good idea. It is safe sex in every way. I mean, no AIDS, no HIV positive. You can just sort of sit back in the chair and strap on your helmet, put on your helmet, strap on your jacket, and away you go. In thinking about uh, virtual reality and synthetic experience and synthetic pleasures, there's a neat little thought experiment it goes into the heading of experience machine. This would be a machine which you'd attach yourself to by uh, you know, planting electrodes on your brain and uh, you'd receive certain stimuli from this machine. And in fact, you'd be able to receive any sort of stimuli that you desired. You'd be able to have a very vivid experience of having sex with the person of your choice. And this would be the best sex you've ever had in your life. That'd be absolutely guaranteed. You'd have this wonderful sex experience. And the question is, would you want to be hooked up to this machine for the rest of your natural life, your entire life? 
Interestingly, Oscar Wilde said there are two calamities in this life. One is that you get none of the things that you've dreamed for, and the other is that you get absolutely everything that you dream for. We pleasure ourselves to death. Maybe too much pleasure can be boring. What makes orgasm exciting is that it's not perpetual. People would like to believe that technology is going to change their dull, boring sex life into this really fabulous one, and that the rules of reality don't apply in, you know, in the virtual world or the technological realm. But I don't really view technology as a replacement for sex as we know it. Just take something like a kiss, which is the most fundamental little building block of an erotic experience. How can we possibly simulate that with technology? And why would we want to? Now, say you and I have been married for 40, 50 years. We are still very much in love with each other. We have a lot of experiences. We've been spending a lot of time together, but we can't have the great sex that we used to have. However, if there's a data from your brain, you can still have the intense love and affection and physical feelings that you had before, even though your sensors have broken down, because it still exists in a map in your brain. So you and I can plug into something together. It sounds like the orgasmatron in Barbarella. But in actuality, it takes the technology. We can share those loving experiences that we had for years and years and years. We may even keep records of them and be able to share them. Experiences will be bought and sold like commodities, like they are in the music business and the movie business now. You will plug the whatever the RX1000D interface into the medulla oblongata of your brain, and you will experience what I experienced in 1975 on stage with the Doobie Brothers in New Orleans. You'll experience a downhill ski race. People get so caught up in simulation and those, those aspects of VR that they lose sight of what I think is the real point, which is the use of VR as a place where you can achieve greater contact. The kind of VR that I, I think most people are familiar with was the war in the Gulf. How's it going up there? Everything rocking along all right? <laughs> I mean, here we managed to create something like reality, uh, but we abstracted out of it the people that we were killing. This is the forerunner of great things to come. I think your trip is just going to ignite the excitement and the forward thinking from this country. So I really just wanted to call up and wish you the very best. So it was like a giant video game, and all we were aware of was that we were winning and that we were zapping the opponent. These are not blips on the screen. Game over. They're people. I look for a VR where, where I, can, I can hug my daughter and have her feel it, even though she might be in Wyoming and I might be in New York. That's what I want.
I want a VR where, where people who, who can't stand up and walk can dance with the people they love. Science and technology is a sword. On one hand, if it's wielded by people who are concerned about other people, the sword could cut against ignorance, poverty, disease, and liberate humanity. Or, if it is wielded by the Pentagon and by the aerospace industries, then perhaps we will have weapons of incredible destructive power, like cruise missiles that have pattern recognition abilities that can recognize objects and drop bombs on them. So I think it's a question that technology itself is neither evil nor saint-like. It's a question of who wields the sword. The key to the future is whether we will have a culture that celebrates imagination, that celebrates play, that is adventurous and fun, or whether we'll have a future in which we continue to seek greater and greater power. What I do think we need is adventures that last centuries. And that's why virtual reality is so interesting to me, because it really will take centuries to figure out what it means to communicate with other people by directly creating the shared world between us without any limitation. This new generation that nobody knows what to call is their high, they're hippies with beepers. They're high tech hippies. And then, of course, the real powerhouse are kids between the ages of a four and a, oh, I don't know, 14. And uh, they'll be teaching. And that is more important than what I think because they're going to be running the world in 20 years. Someday, there will be a generation of kids that grows up that's really good at making up what's inside a virtual world, at making up all of the plants and buildings and things that we have no words for that aren't plants or buildings. And when they grow up together, they're gonna have a new way to communicate with one another. Since our generation is writing the constitution for the future of history, we're creating many things that cannot be undone. And yet, we have no choice. There's no such thing as standing still. We're too in love with technology to retreat from it. So we must do it well. And of course, I can become stressed out and I worry. I, I wonder if we will succeed in doing it as well as we can, but I really, I believe we will. I believe that there's a certain kind of process and the tension we have with one another that makes things better and that we will come through.